Hello. I want to welcome you to this four week introduction to cost and financing options in response to the impacts of a changing climate. Now, there is a class assignment to be completed by the end of this week at the end of this presentation. And it also can be found under the lesson plan. Um, so let's begin. And I just want to start with some political economic basics. Uh, I believe this may be reviewed for some of you, but it allows us all to come up to speed in regards to some economic tenets, so to have a more robust conversation throughout the course. Now, taking a microeconomics perspective, the market is a system in which we all participate. The greenhouse gas loading into the environment is the result of both the provision of goods and services by the producers of the market, as well as the decisions we make as consumers. The major communication of what goods and services are provided and thus what greenhouse gas loading may occur is the price of those goods and services. The price put on these goods and services are the cost of production, that is the capital, the production space and equipment, labor, and natural resources as inputs. The price also includes a profit margin above the cost of production. Now the cost of production will not include the health and environmental costs that can be attributed to the emissions that are byproducts of production. These costs are external. That means they're not accounted for in the price of a good or service. In other words, the price the consumer pays does not reflect the true cost that the larger society incurs. Now, this is what economists call a market failure. With, with such a failure, when it's recognized, the political system has the ability to intervene in the economic system and correct such a market failure. Ultimately, both the economic and political system are embedded within the environmental system. Unsustainable use of natural resources going into production can cause a system shift in the environment. Sometimes this is called a bifurcation. The recent collapse of the cod fishing industry in the Gulf of Maine is an example of such a bifurcation. In addition, non-controlled emissions going into the environment can also cause this overarching shift in the environment, this bifurcation. The uncontrolled releases of greenhouse gases as seen as a bifurcation in the climate. In both cases, these bifurcations occur based on what decisions we make as individuals, either as an employee of an organization that makes a good or provides a service, and definitely at home as a consumer choosing specific goods and services. Now, such goods that are produced can be defined as a private good, which we pay for directly through the market system, such as a can of Coca-Cola. Now, when we say it's, there's rivalry and excludability, a good is rivalrous if one person consuming it uses it up, meaning someone else cannot consume it. A good is excludable if you can prevent somebody from using it. For example, if you go to a play, there's only so many tickets. If you buy the last ticket and all the tickets are sold, others are excluded from seeing the play. Now then, there's what we call public goods. 
And a good example of that is street lighting. Everybody can go down a street and use the street light and to see their way. As you go down the street, you're not paying for that good. However, you do eventually pay for it indirectly through the taxes embedded within the political system. And finally, there are those free goods provided by the environmental system. The essence of a, such a free good is the utilization by one person doesn't inhibit the use of it by another. Free goods are the oceans or the rivers we float down or the air we breathe or the atmosphere. Such free public goods have been often termed the commons, where everyone has access to it. Now the decisions and the resultant structures and processes that impact this commons are both the level of the market system as well as the political and regulatory system. Now when it comes to the commons, the market often fails to address the health of the commons. The failure is due to factors that the market does not recognize, which means the damage to the commons, and that is a cost, are not accounted for in the price of a market good or service that basically uses that commons. Because this cost is not internalized into the price of a good, it is known as an externality. In a sense, it is external to the market. If the externality harms others, thus cause a cost to others, it is known as a negative externality. A negative externality would be the reduction of a protein source for the world's society due to overfishing or the impacts to coastal communities from a rising sea level due to a changing climate caused by greenhouse gas emissions. Now, in order to internalize such externality, it is often required that policy and associate regulations are passed to do so. Now, a famous example of a negative externality was used by the evolutionary ecologist Garrett Hardin in his famous treatise, The Tragedy of the Commons. In this simple example, cows are purchased and are sent to graze on the commons that everyone shares equally. And they are there until it's time to bring them in and milk them. Now the amount of milk produced by any single cow depends on the amount of grass she has eaten. In this example, the cows are on public land and the grass is a free good. Hypothetically, consider that every farmer has one cow on the commons and thus produce an equal weight of milk amongst themselves. Then, one day, Farmer George decides he's going to add a second cow to the commons. That additional cow, by eating some of the grass, imposes a cost on all the other farmers. This is because there's now less grass available for their single cow. Thus, Farmer George has imposed an external cost onto the other farmers while reaping a personal benefit of increased milk production due to having an extra cow. Now, taking the next logical step, the other farmers will see the benefit of adding another cow to the commons. And although the amount of milk per cow will be reduced as the grass is shared by more mouths to feed, over the short term, the total amount of milk that each farmer produces will increase. But such a natural system has a limit to how much grass can sustainably grow on the commons. When the farmers introduce more and more cattle to increase their total milk production, there is a limit to this production growth. 
And that limit is set by what we call the carrying capacity of the commons. The environment has a limit. The resultant overgrazing and associated erosion of topsoil, let's say, limits the ability for grass to renew. An environmental bifurcation has occurred where the system has shifted in a way no farmer is able to produce milk at a profit. Remember the dust bowl? And although scientists and resource managers may be able to project such a bifurcation could happen, the individual farmer gains nothing from reducing his stock at the moment unless the other farmers do the same. From an economic perspective, there is no economic signal to inform each farmer that the commons is approaching a bifurcation. Rather, the market signal to the farmer, such as Farmer George out there, who do recognize they are seeing less milk per cow, that to maintain total milk production, thus total revenue, they must add more cows. And as such, this is the tragedy. Now the tragedy of the global commons related to climate change is the emission of greenhouse gases. There are economic incentives not to incorporate the negative effects or externalities of such emissions into the cost of production. Because for those that do, will produce products at a higher cost. So they have to ch charge consumers a higher price to offset the additional costs, which makes them less competitive in the marketplace. Now the imposition of policies and associated regulations that force externalities to be internalized in the price of goods or service to protect the commons rest upon what is known as the public trust doctrine. Distilled to its essence, the public trust doctrine is a concept that is both simple and intuitive. The doctrine requires governments to maintain the public trust through stewardship of the natural resources upon which society and by extension, our economy and government depends for continued existence. The public trust doctrine has been called the oldest expression of environmental law. And its roots extend at least as far back as sixth century Roman law and Roman law influenced the creation of English common law, which in turn influenced US common law. The public trust doctrine survives in the United States as one of the most important far reaching doctrines of American property law. And in looking across the globe's nations, the public trust doctrine is manifested in many of these legal systems. Besides Europe, the doctrine is inherent within the cultures of the ancient societies from Asia, Africa, Muslim countries, and even Native Americans. In the US, to protect the public trust, the government has historically intervened in the market by setting natural resource extraction quotas or emission standards and fining those for non-compliance. Such regulations force producers to expend funds to meet such regulatory standards imposed by policy decisions. These added production costs are passed on to consumers through the higher production cost. And if everyone in the same sector of the economy have to abide by the same standards, you have an equal playing field and the cost are internalized in the price of a product that consumers see across the board, so no one has a competitive advantage. But there is no global public trust doctrine. The Declaration on the Human Environment at the 1972 United Nations Stockholm Conference recognized an urgent need for international cooperation to protect, protect the commons. 
But since that time, the UN has not formally developed an international public trust doctrine. And as such, there's no regulatory or global market structure that has been in place to forward a worldwide public trust doctrine. Although there are international treaties among some of the countries in the world that have attempted to protect the commons. In recent history, the most successful one was the 1987 Montreal Protocol that banned agreed upon substances that depleted the ozone layer. Two international treaties to address the loading of greenhouse gases were the Kyoto Accord agreed to in 1997, which the US Senate did not ratify, and the Paris Agreement of 2016, which the current US administration is pulling out of. And, but for many international treaties to protect the commons, such as protecting the oceans, protecting fisheries, protecting the atmosphere, protecting wildlife, etc. Signatories do not necessarily include every country across the globe. And the participation by the countries to meet certain limits are voluntary. And as a point of international law, there is no real overarching enforcement regulation to protect these commons under these treaties even though some of them do go to places like the World Trade Organization for res Resolution and the World Court at The Hague. Now, with this introduction for week one, your assignment will be to answer the following questions. I want you to do some research and find out what strategy ha has been develop or put forward to avoid and mitigate a tragedy of the commons. And this is important because climate change is such a tragedy. I want you to post your review as a Word document on the designated class site, and you'll find that link in the lesson plan for week one. I also want to make sure you provide citations of all the sources that you've used. Primary sources are preferred. What I mean is primary literature, that's journal articles. However, I'll take news analyses as a secondary source, but definitely no Wikipedia. And then I want you to respond to another student's post with some critical follow-up questions that would better clarify for you what is being related by them. So with that, I'm going to end this short presentation and I will be talking to you again soon.